team! Meandering behind the crowd, as usual, I'm finally attending the Queen's Ball. As a gift, I ordered VIP tickets for the DC experience for a mother-daughter trip. My mom started her ensemble months ago and was vastly more ready to attend than I was, but I did manage to whip up a gown in less than a week, cause test it at a Bridgerton watch party, add a bunch of fancy trim, DIY some accessories, and then realize I hated the trim and remove it. Thank you to all of those attendees who went in the preceding weeks and posted content which made it easier for me to determine what I'd actually want to take to this event. In order to prepare, I sewed a gown, open robe, and matching mask. Everything was stash busted from what turned out to be a fairly Princess Zelda from Twilight Princess color palette. I didn't lean into that because I was in a rush, but I did decorate a paper hand fan with the silent princess flower to amuse myself. I used Laughing Moon 126, the bib front version, measured to fit over my Willoughby and Rose chemise, red threaded Regency long stays, and my blue linen petticoat. Once the historically inspired profile was achieved, I pivoted to the Bridgerton fantasy using a crushed poly satin for the white gown and a plastic gold trim at the hem and at the sleeves. I had a very limited amount of this 20 year old fabric and I am delighted to have it all out of my stash in one go. The hem is turned with gold piping and bound with gold jacquard on the inside because it made sense at the time. After wearing the gown to Love Shutterbug's Season 2 watch party, I went back and added a bit of lace and gold sequins to the gathered bodice section to camouflage the line of binding that was on my stays. I also painstakingly added more of the gold trim down the center front similar to this fashion plate, but tried everything on, absolutely hated it, then had to get out the seam ripper to banish it from my life. The sleeves need to be removed and reset, but that takes effort and this is ultimately going into the closet until I need another Regency cosplay. A plain white gown can cover any number of characters with the right accessories, including Storm from the X-Men, Persephone from Lore Olympus, and Supergirl's Décolletage. I guessed at the open robe design by using the same laughing moon pattern by redrawing the bodice front to wrap the underbust and omitting the front skirt panel. The bodice is pieced from the purple stretch velvet scraps left over from my jingle jangle walking skirt. I wanted to add some visual interest and proportion to the sleeves, so with Rapunzel in mind, I did a weird take on a pained sleeve and the riding habit sleeve treatment in Patterns of Fashion 1. These sleeves also need to be reset, but I'd just as soon take them off. The longest part was the robe's pomegranate embroidery, which took about 14 hours, excluding thread changes, thread breaks, and a night of troubleshooting when my Ruby Designer 90 decided to recalibrate during the stitch out. Because of that, I had to make a stand-in train for the watch party. It was made of a lilac chiffon and periwinkle poly taffeta bow with the smaller pomegranate embroidery at the points. For the final train, I'd originally planned to use a lavender poly satin as a train facing and dirt catcher, but I was dealing with three different widths of fabric and mathed the whole thing badly. In the end, I just lined the skirt with white muslin. The trim at the neckline of the robe has wire in it, so I tucked the excess into the bodice with a little scrap pocket and pin. Thanks to advice from some helpful folks on Instagram, I chose a simple whip stitch to temporarily attach it. I really love this trim, so the idea was to avoid cutting it for future use. This look gives me the Bridgerton vibe on a con crunch stash buster budget, so I'm happy enough to wear it for a quick turn of the room, which we'll take a look at later. The Queen's Ball did require proof of jab at the door, but for safety, I went ahead and made a matching mask. This one is the fitted style with a filter pocket made from poly satin interlining and white cotton lining with a decorated outer layer of the periwinkle taffeta, lace overlay, gold trim, and sequins. I pinned a length of jewelry chain to the inside of my bodice and attached it to the elastic earband so that it wouldn't get lost while taking sips of my beverage. 
With a mind to be as hands-free as possible for drinks and such, I added a couple of pockets to my ensemble. One on the left side of the petticoat for my wallet and keys, and a right side pocket to the outer garment for my phone and incidentals. In a smaller crowd, I would absolutely drape my train over my arm like I'm modeling for a fashion plate, but rightly assuming that this audience isn't one to pay attention to where they're walking, I added a loop at the center back to bustle the hem while dancing and while walking to and from the car. My necklace, earrings, and brooch are from Dames à la Mode, and my tiara is from my stash. I'm wearing clocked silk stockings and a pair of generic white pointed toe flats to which I added satin ribbon. Originally, I'd planned to stash my cell phone in my reticule like I usually do, not bothering to take it out unless I have time for a photo or need to send a message. But after reviewing everyone else's content, I realized that my phone was going to need to be an extension of my hand for most of the event. In that capacity, it would also need to be usable with my gloves on because I am a fancy lady. My three-button elbow-length gloves that allow me to release my hand without taking off the gloves needed a bit of mending, and I didn't want to add... And we're back, because my phone stopped a while ago, and I didn't notice, and the dogs next door are going a little crazy, and I had to make mac and cheese, like the real stuff, and I'm in stays and stuff, so, you know, me and Masu Chef had to get it together. <sighs> Also, my coffee is cold and I'm not happy. My three button elbow length gloves that allow me to release my hand without taking the gloves off needed a bit of mending and I didn't want to add contrasting conductive thread to my newer pair of ivory elbow length gloves. So I decided to go with a stylus. Additionally, I'd be relying on my mom or strangers to take photos with my device. All that in mind, I decided to make an attachment that could slip inside of my existing rubber phone case and keep my stylus handy. This is what I came up with. You can make or purchase similarly tabbed hand straps. They just need to be made up of a thin, sturdy material that can hold up to hanging off of your arm without pulling off the case. I've already done a mock-up out of paper and duct tape, so now I'm just going to refine the shape and transfer it to my decorative placard. My reference for the visible side is this dance calling card book dated to the 1820s. The book is mother of pearl with gold accents and has a gold pencil. As I said, we are stash busting, so I'm not going to bother modding my existing stylus. If anyone even notices the case, then they'll probably know what I was going for. I'm using iridescent transfer vinyl still attached to the paper. I added a strip of duct tape to the hanging loop for strength. On the iridescent side, I'm placing down gold washi tape that I cut with decorative border scissors. This is done all around the outer edge, and the cutouts for the lens and fingerprint sensor were cut with glow-in-the-dark nail stickers. This is fiddly and not fun to do, so I do not recommend it. For this application, you could also use scrapbooking materials, gold foil makeup tattoos, those paper doilies that they put under cakes, or you could design your own custom border with gold vinyl and a cutting machine, which is definitely the route I should have taken. Again, the key here is keeping the decoration paper thin so that your phone stays locked into the case. Obviously, you could also add 3D decoration to the outside of a case, but this is for one event and I didn't want to have to order another blank phone case for mundane use. Once I've confirmed that the case still fits with the phone, it's time to add the hardware. I'm using a swivel hook from an old event lanyard to suspend a satin ribbon hand strap. I have to fold the hangy bit to place it through the loop, and I could have just made a separate piece like the ones that you can buy, but I was in the moment. Don't make my mistake. Mistakes. Many mistakes were made, but the result is fine. After I'm done wasting time with that, the ribbon is simply knotted on one end and the edges are melted to prevent the polyester from fraying. Don't worry, I'm going to wisen up later and hand stitch the ends of the ribbon together because the knot is unsightly, but I still melt the edges so that part's valid. Next, I add a jewelry chain from an old necklace to the hook. This will attach to the end of the stylus, so it's important to measure how much lead you require in order to effectively poke at the touchscreen. It's also important to have good jump rings on hand, which I do not. 
so I fully expect this to fall apart at the event. It's fine. My stylus is somewhat modular, so I unscrew all of the pieces and take it down to half size. I would have preferred to have the pink aluminum shaft with the rounded tip, but the rubber bits don't unscrew, much to my dismay. Again, this is a minor detail which could be remedied with primer and paint or by ordering a smaller gold stylus, which I'm not going to do. The stylus hook slips right into the tabs but will make it impossible to use the volume buttons. Alternatively, it can just hang free if you're cool with that. As future Shasta will find out later, the stylus hook does not fit right into the tabs and the metal nib doesn't work with the screen protector that was just delivered, so she's going to swap the weird pen style nib in instead. And that's it for my dance card. The Queen's Ball was a mini excursion that involved securing a sitter, traveling a few hours to my mom's house, then to DC for the ball. For that reason, I had to prep and pack thoughtfully to minimize wrinkling, damage to my accessories, and time spent getting ready. My shift, stays, and petticoat were layered and rolled as one with the busk determining the width of the bundle. I laid out the open robe with the gown inside. Normally I would hang them in a garment bag, but I didn't feel like going to the basement to find one. I folded in the sides, folded up the hem, and placed my underpinnings just below the empire seam. There's a lot of trim going on at the top, so I didn't want to roll everything and risk it getting smashed. Hair and makeup items went into a generic tote, and the curling iron was wrapped separately to avoid the oils from getting onto my clothes. The soles on my shoes were lightly cleaned before I put them away after the first time I wore them, so I left them in the individual soft bags that they originally came with and popped them into a pocket on my duffel bag. My jewelry and tiara went into a cigar box that I retrofitted with EVA foam and velvet scraps to keep things from shifting, tangling, scratching, and breaking. Thanks to my awesome neighbor, I have a stack of cigar boxes, so I'll record the next one that I fix up. My gloves, hand fan, battery backup, and cable went into a reticule even though I didn't have plans to use it at the event. It's always a good idea to have an extra bag literally on hand. For hair prep, my sides were shaved and my hair was conditioned and stretched out the night before. I use a blow dryer to get most of my length after conditioning, then I straighten with a hot brush if I want to mimic the texture of the filler braid that I'll be using for this hairstyle. My hair is parted side to side at the crown to make a front and back section. I use a rat tail comb to make a center part in the front then part the back side to side again. The top goes into a ponytail holder as a centerpiece for the filler braid. I make two small braids out of that and then two small braids at the bottom, going upward so that I can wrap them into the style.
The filler braid, which needs to be brushed out and redone without the elastic bands, is centered at the top of my head with a spin pin. I then wrap each side around, pinning as I go with more spin pins, U-pins, and bobby pins. Next, I pin the lower and the upper braids into the bundle, giving little peaks of this season's hair color, which is green, to match what will be visible in the front later. The front is parted side to side, forward of my ear, allowing enough room for the tiara to sit out as far as possible. Shout out to Status Thimble Sewing on Instagram for the black ribbon harness trick. I use a half inch barrel curling iron to make the dangly bits that are framing my face. They are all curled toward the center. I left my got-to-be hairspray at home, but my mom came through with a sample size from her stash since neither of us use it on the regular. I've used makeup setting spray on my hair in a pinch, and this stuff smelled very similar to the Mehran. I smoothed down the hair around my part and used bobby pins to anchor the curls to the outside. This is a bit precarious since I don't have much room to secure the pins, but I want to keep them from constantly falling into my face. It worked, but for next time I'll probably just change the curl arrangement. Next, we add the tiara. For this version, 
I braided the ribbon into the remaining sections of hair to keep it secure, similar to the hair lacing in Tudor Taylor. As long as you don't do any back bends at the ball, the tiara won't move. Unfortunately, this tiara has a point that digs into my head right at the center part. I forgot to add padding to this one before I packed it, so I'm using a piece of paper towel temporarily. I wrap and pin my ribbon braids around the whole style and put a bow at the top. I roll the excess ribbon and secure it under the point with bobby pins. To finish, I keep adding pins until nothing feels loose or out of place. After we were properly attired and ready for a drive, we headed out for the ball. My mom's reaction to the VIP surprise was adorable, and after a short wait, we were ushered into the merch area and the reception. All of the set designs were so lovely and inspiring for my own selfie backgrounds at home. That was the real draw for this type of event, which I can totally respect, and I wish that there were more areas like this at themed conventions and at photo ops. The artist studio was really cool, but the QR code disappeared before I could get my phone back out and no one on staff could tell me how to bring it back up, so I only grabbed a glimpse of it from afar later in the evening. We made an attempt at what I think was a scavenger hunt, but with everything else going on, we just grabbed drinks from the bar and milled around looking at all the details. The staff was professional and moved things along like clockwork, despite the large number of people queued up for each set. Mom and I curtsied as a duo and received a card from the Queen, which was a delightful touch. I could have done with fewer audience members since it became an uncomfortable press of bodies when it was time to move into the ballroom. We headed right for the VIP seats where I stayed for the remainder of the show. As a dancer myself, I appreciated the artistic display of movement and music. I too have hung from fixtures and curtains in my day. My mom got up for some light dancing and while I didn't understand the dancing bee, especially with the season two plot, I fully appreciated the frilly, bloomered cheerleader persona that came with that role. We didn't get our VIP champagne until the end of the ball because no one told us how to redeem them, and I included that on my feedback form. I knew up front that the event was only 90 minutes, so my expectations were tempered in that respect. 
Like anything else, if you can suspend your disbelief and let the fantasy sweep you away, this Bridgerton experience was a lovely little ride for any fans of the show. As predicted, my stylus fell off the chain the first time I pulled it out for a picture, which was rude since I'd had it connected for a full week without any issues. I ultimately lost the stylus at the end of the event, but I know what changes to make for the next one. My petticoat pocket ended up being a bust because it was set too far back to access without pulling up my gown. That meant that I had to use my reticule, which was heavy and annoying, and I kept losing things in it. The robe pocket was fine, but it was hard to feel in my gloves while being in a rush to pay for drinks, put away the lady whistle down paper, hang on to my VIP ticket, and find my hand fan, which I didn't open. Not once. That said, I'm glad that I over-engineered my outfit because it kept me distracted from being in a crowd of strangers who stepped on my mom's train more times than I can count. I ended up not bustling my train and managed to perfect the arm sweep pretty quickly. In all, the outfit held up great and was super comfortable, which is always my goal. After we arrived back at mom's house, we took a few more pictures in the backyard to further justify getting all dolled up. Then I headed home to start the next sewing adventure. Thanks for watching! After we were proper, you're, are you, are you, are really? I'll just be here waiting. This coffee is so cold. Are you done pressing aluminum foil? Rude. This is why I keep running out of storage. You done? Hello? Are you done with the water too? <laughs> the rope pocket was fine, but hard to- You rat bastard! Hello? I'm calling you for help. Did you stop the timer? Yes, I stopped the timer. Okay, does it look done? <laughs>